I'm Zero Age. This is Ryan. We're with OpenSea, and we're going to talk about the Seaport marketplace and some more advanced techniques for how to utilize it and interact with it and build on top. So, Seaport is a beast. There's it's a single contract, but there's a lot going on, and so we're going to work our way through. First, start with some of the high-level uh, key points, and then from there we'll We'll get into some of these advanced techniques. So, first thing to understand is that there are two arrays that dictate the basics of a seaport listing or offer. The first is the offer, and that's all of the items native tokens, ERC20, ERC721, 1155 that you, the offerer, are going to spend. Then, on the other end, you have consideration, which is everything that you or others are going to get back. If you want to spend the offer items, you got to get the consideration. So there's also this idea of a zone. Every seaport order has an optional zone that you can set. That's a contract that gives a thumbs up or a thumbs down on whether that particular order is still valid. There's also a concept of a conduit which is a, it's a contract that you can approve to uh, transfer your tokens. So you set your approvals on the conduit, and from there, uh, you can set additional marketplaces or contracts on that conduit, support multiple marketplaces, migrate to new versions of Seaport, so on and so forth. So when you, it comes time to create an order, to list your NFT, you, the primary way to do it is you just sign an off-chain listing. This is an example payload that you would see in MetaMask. You're going to have to pop open the expanded view to get this whole thing, but it's got the offer array, consideration array, start time, end time, zone, conduit. Then another method you can use to create an order is to call this function validate. And that means you don't need a signature at all. You just provide the order and it gets listed on chain, so to speak. The interesting thing about both signing an order or calling validate is you have to explicitly cancel. You have to actually call and tell Seaport, I'm no longer interested in filling this. Signatures are not just standard. ECDSA, they're also support for 1271, which is is valid signature. Seaport will give the offerer a digest, basically the order hash, and a signature, and then leave it up to the contract to say, yes, this order is good, this one's not. And that works with both traditional signatures as well as validations. And you can use this technique to list from a smart wallet or a multi-sig without having to pay gas. But you can also, and here we start to get into the advanced techniques, you can utilize 1271 to do dynamic orders where you might have a contract that's willing to, it's, it wants to update the order based on a price that's coming back from an Oracle, or maybe it's implementing uh, a bonding curve, or it's a pool, something to that effect. So what you do is instead of giving the signature for 1271, you actually give the order itself. Then, and this, there's a, a trick you can do here where you can actually supply an offset to call data that reuses the same segment of call data that you already provided with the order and cut down on the overhead of doing this. But then what the offerer that's getting called will basically have to do is rehash the order, derive that digest, and compare it to the one that was supplied by 1271. Then it knows that the order that you gave is the signature is in fact the correct order that's being filled at the moment. And then it can go and look, okay, let's check out this offer item, this consideration item and make sure that they 
match whatever the, the latest state that we expect is. So that's a really interesting technique to, to do more dynamic orders. You got a question? So this is not zones. This is if you have a contract that is going to serve as an offer. And so it could have its own validation logic on the contract as part of this. But it could also utilize a zone, right? That's very much a, a something that it could piggyback on validation logic in a zone. All right. So that's creating orders. Let's talk about fulfilling them. The standard method for fulfilling an order is to call this function fulfill order. And, or fulfill orders is the actual function. And you basically just give this whole payload, just like the payload that you signed, you provide it to this function, and it creates an implied second order, a mirror image of the first one, where every item that's being offered on the order you're fulfilling, you just say, all right, I will take that and take all of those items. Those are your consideration items with you as the recipient. Then look at all those consideration items. I'll, I'll send those out. I'll pay them. That's the, the basic method. But there's also a basic method, which is there's a small subset of orders that actually constitute a pretty wide swath of what people are generally doing, which is I want to buy an NFT. I want to sell an NFT and maybe pay a fee. Seaport doesn't actually have a notion of fees at all. So it's everything is just another item. But if you have one of these simple subsets, you got a single offer item, you've got one or more consideration items and it, you take that sum total of all the items, there's one NFT. That's part of that. Everything else is a single item type. It's a, they're all weth or they're all die or something like that. Then you can call this other function and it performs a more optimized fulfillment. Less call data. You just need to su supply a subset, like give all the additional recipients, which spells out, um, Usually it's used for fees. And uh, on top of that, the basic fulfillment methods have a slight deviation where if the offer is, the item is a ERC20 token or native token, then it will be used to pay for all the non-NFT consideration items. So you don't have to take everything. You can minimize the number of transfers that are occurring. That's a common theme with, uh, you'll see, uh, as we get into these subsequent fulfillment methods, it's all about cutting down on the, the top efficiency gain is from reducing the number of transfers, right? Particularly with tokens, native tokens a little different, but with other tokens, it gets very expensive if you're doing redundant transfers. So when you want to buy five NFTs, you want to sweep the floor, right? Oftentimes you'll have each one of those has a fee attached. What if those, that fee recipient is the same recipient? You don't want to do five transfers. You want to do one. So we use this fulfill available orders method. This basically goes through each order and says, has this been fulfilled? Has it been canceled? If it's still valid, then we'll go for it. If the order is not valid anymore, we'll skip it. And you supply the, you basically point to, okay, this order, this item, that order, that item. These all have the exact same item type. They all have the same uh, ID. If you're talking about an 1155 token, they all have the same recipient. Effectively, they can be condensed into a single transfer. Cuts down a lot on uh, the number of transfers there. Then you have this method, match orders. When you're talking about fulfill orders, fulfill available orders, Seaport's not going to be able to figure out on its own how to do these transfers. The way that it works 
is you're going to walk through every single fulfillment. And it's the same idea as fulfill available orders. Here's the order. Here's an item. Here's another item. Here's another item. Let's, let's aggregate all these together. Then we're going to match those with this item, this item, this item on these orders on the consideration side. And that whole group gets distilled down into a single transfer. So this method is, it's not utilized as often if you just want to buy an NFT. This is what you really want to reach for in the power use cases where you have your, maybe you're searching, like you're looking for MEV where you can find a, a price mismatch or you want to compose multiple different orders with zones and um, get them to all fit together in a neat little puzzle piece. The big thing to be aware of with this is that if there's a problem, after you supply all these fulfillments, it's going to go through and make sure that every single consideration item on every single order has been fully credited. It's got to be zero on every single one or else the, the whole batch will come crashing down, it'll revert. So definitely this is, this is the power feature. And uh, uh, the first thing you want to reach for if you're looking for searching or, um, or more advanced strategies. Okay, let's talk about some zones. Zones is the, it's the main mechanic by which you would extend Seaport. Any order can choose its own zone and then say, I'm a restricted order, set the type as restricted. Now the zone gets to decide whether or not the order's good or bad. And in addition, you can always extend the consideration array. You can always add items as the fulfiller. We call them tips. This is, it's cool because you can take an order that came from one marketplace you can fulfill it on another and apply a tip. What you can also do is you can use logic in the zones to ensure that the tip that got supplied matches whatever it is that, that you expect it to. Maybe that's a dynamic calculation of on-chain royalties, right? Something like that. So let's talk about a couple potential zones, things you could use them for. So one, application of zones is for dynamic NFT metadata. Certain items in Seaport, they're called criteria-based items. And in place of giving a token ID, an identifier, you instead give a Merkle root. And this Merkle root is comprised of all the token IDs that are valid. Or you can give an empty one and that signifies it's a wild card. You can pick whatever token ID you want. But this only gives you so much granularity because at the time that you sign the order, it might have certain metadata. But maybe the metadata gets updated, right? So the traits, the attributes that, that this had at the time you created the order, they've changed now. So you can obviously leverage zones for this, anytime that a creator of an NFT updates their metadata, they go and they update the zone, registering that, hey, this particular Merkle root is actually now this other one, right? And you can't match the tokens that have changed. Another potential use case is for compromised NFTs. You might have an NFT that gets stolen and um, you don't wanna be able to trade it anymore. And that's one potential use case for a zone is to just check and make sure that the items that are part of the order are no longer fulfillable. Another cool potential use case is for front running resistance. Say I have a zone where I have to call five minutes ahead of time and commit similar to how you would do it with, um, I believe ENS has a similar thing. You register ahead of time and say, 
I want to fill this. Then you wait some period of time and then you reveal. You include as part of the, the parameters called extra data. When you're fulfilling, that gets passed along to the zone. The zone then can look and say, oh, there's a commit. I'm going to hash this. It looks like you committed to being able to fulfill this order. Another interesting one is leveraging oracles. Maybe I have a listing. I don't want this listing to be fulfillable if the floor falls out. So I could read from an oracle that is periodically updated. And if the price drifts too much, then cancel the order. Don't let it be fulfilled. Or you can even leverage this along with that trick with uh, dynamic orders with 1271 to create a strategy that will buy NFTs below the floor price, sell NFTs above the floor price, that kind of thing. So here's some links. Uh, we've got obviously the Seaport repo itself, as well as um, any, any questions or you wanna get into the, the weeds, the discussions, uh, there are great place for that. Seaport JS is a library for interacting with Seaport. Makes a lot of this stuff much more uh, straightforward. One thing that I will note is that much of the match orders functionality is a little more rough around the edges. Would love any contributions if anyone finds themselves working on that. And then this last link, Seaport Order Validator. This is a contract that we put together to make it easier for checking an order or if you are accepting new orders coming in, there's a lot, there's a lot of gotchas, things that can go wrong. Um, and it's a quick way to say, oh, this order looks like you're not actually getting anything from the order, right? You're not set as one of the recipients on a consideration item. You sure you want to do this? There's a hundred permutations of things that can be um, maybe a warning or an outright error, right? So it'll check uh, on chain registry for uh, creator information, like make sure that the, the tokens implement EIP-165, that you're not trying to pretend like one, one token that's actually a, a NFT is an ERC-20 token, something like that. All kinds of interesting stuff. And if you're trying to just piece together the potential uh, things that can go wrong, this is a great resource. So how are we doing on time? All right. I think we can open it up for discussion. First off, if anybody is currently building on top of Seaport and has a, a sticking point or a question, by all means, let's, let's hear them. Yeah, here, let me bring the mic over. I am not building on Seaport at the moment, but I do have a question. Questions? Great, yes. Um, so certain NFTs have royalties associated with them. And I was wondering, do you include the royalties in the orders themselves, or does that get handled somewhere else in the contract? And if so, how does optimization happen on that front? Yeah, so the basic approach, as I mentioned earlier, Seaport doesn't have any notion of fees or royalties that's baked in. It's just you could very easily create an order that doesn't include any fees or royalties whatsoever. So it's really up to the discretion of the application layer, whoever's building on top of it. Um, one approach you can take that I think is a pretty good one is to just read from the registries at the time the order is created. This, depending on your perspective, is either a feature or a bug. One thing that I would consider a bug is if when I go to create a listing, the royalty is 5%. And I'm like, okay, I sign my listing. Now the creator goes and changes that to 50%. That's a problem and I might not have listed it if I knew that I was gonna have to pay that, right? Then there's also the question of, well, what if they just want to 
tweak the recipient of the royalty or something like that. For those cases, you can leverage tipping, right? So I mentioned earlier that you can always add additional items to the consideration array. You can't add them to the offer array. You can't decide that the offer is going to spend more than they originally agreed to. That's, that's a very important invariant not to break. But um, you can always say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll give out something extra. You combine that with, call it a, a royalty zone. The royalty zone will go. It will read from in real time from the registry and ensure that the last consideration item, this tip, matches what the registry has on file. So then the only way you're going to be able to fulfill it is to supply the correct updated information. That's sort of the, the gist. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Yes. I have a question about one of your earlier slides. So you, on the matching orders slide, you have this uh, statement, which you wrote something along the lines of like, if a searcher identifies an opportunity, there it is. So a searcher identifies an opportunity, you can take whatever leftover item amounts and match them to a new consideration item to itself. So I'm a little confused because my understanding of the architecture is that in every single type of order or function call you make, all considerations have to be met on the other side. So I'm a little confused how you like, like in the, in the case of like <clears throat> the classic case of arbitrage, right? Like there has to be an opportunity on the table for the arbitrager to take. And it's, it's not clear to me what this means for, for an opportunity. If the considerations are always evened out or yeah, what that's, that means. it's a great question. And it, this is actually a good, a good opportunity to get into just the, the nitty gritty on how this would look. Let's just consider a really simple stripped down case where you have one listing. So the way this might look is I want to sell my NFT, right? So I have one offer item, which is my NFT and one consideration item, we'll call it five weth, okay? With the recipient being me, the offerer, right? Now someone else likes my NFT. They don't realize that I've already listed it for five weth, okay? They put out an offer, a, a bid on the NFT to buy it. And they offer six weth. So the way it would look for them is I'm offering six weth, one offer item, one consideration item. This NFT recipient is me. So now person number three searcher comes along and realizes that there's this uh, mismatch. They call match orders. They supply both of these orders and they give a fulfillment saying, okay, Order zero, item zero is the NFT. Order one, item zero on the consideration side is also the NFT. These match. That turns into a single transfer from the offerer A to offerer B. Then we do a, another match fulfillment. Order zero, item, I'm sorry, order one, item zero which is the six weth order zero item zero on the consideration side is the, the five weth. Those now match. The way that this works now is that they get the, the five weth gets credited. Okay. That's been accounted for the six weth gets spent. There's one weth left. You can actually leave offer item amounts on the table. There's not, there's not a reason that you have to spend all of the offer items, but you do have to credit all of the consideration items. So we could leave it at that. You could match those two orders and the original or the, the order B, the person that made the bid, just end up paying five. But what would, in practice, what would happen is that this the person who located the opportunity might say, I'm going to create a third order. And this third order, I'm offering nothing. It's an empty array. 
consideration item one with recipient is me. And then they create another fulfillment that, you know, matches the, the same one that we've just spent five from with the new one. You don't even have to create a new order. You can also just add on a tip to order B or whatever and use that to match two. So that's the idea there. Other questions? Okay, thanks. Um, so I haven't built anything on Seaport, but I've looked into it a little bit. Uh, just wondering, uh, does it support like natively partial fill orders? Like, is it possible uh, to do yes. a single sign message with like multiple fulfillments? Yeah, uh, let, I'll get into that a little bit. So if the offerer elects to, to support partial fills, it's specified in the order type, just like a restricted order in the zone uh, requires that. So if an order supports partial fills, the way that this works is that you can supply, when you call a normal, it's like fulfill order, uh, fulfill available orders, match orders, those don't do partial fills, but there's also fulfill advanced orders. Uh, match advanced orders, fulfill available advanced orders. Those you give criteria resolvers, basically Merkle proofs for the criteria based items, as well as a fill fraction, a numerator and a denominator. And the, the heuristic is that every single, assuming that the order supports it, every single offer item and every single consideration item is going to get that fraction applied to it. And then once the order is fulfilled, it's just going to update with the fraction, say, here's how much has been fulfilled. The rule it, to avoid any kind of weirdness around rounding errors is that every single one of those fractions has got to be exact. It, it, there can be no remainder after applying the fraction. So in general, when you're constructing an order that supports partial fills from the get-go, the easiest way to do it is to start with a single quantity, right? I have some ERC-1155 tokens that I want to sell for one ETH each, right? I want to sell 10, so I'll now just take the one ETH, multiply that by 10. Take all the fees that were already calculated, multiply those by 10. So it'll be a nice, even, uh, fraction that's applied. The math behind that on the contract is also pretty cool. The uses um, the Euclidean algorithm to ensure that there's, uh, if there's an overflow, we can all uh, be rounded down to the greatest common divisor. But that's that's a different topic. Yes, there's partial fills, and um, and once the basically once the fraction, the fill fraction is applied, and all the criteria resolvers are applied then it's all the exact same flow as with the standard stuff. Yeah. Hey there. Can you talk a little bit about extra cheap signatures and when they should be used? About what signatures? Extra cheap. I see that's a parameter when you're creating an order. And I think you use EIP 2098 in that case. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So 2098 is um, the 64 byte signatures. Yeah. So a standard ECDSA in Ethereum has three parameters, right? V, R, and S. And um, turns out that there's, there's a parity to the V, right? It's almost always 27 or 28, right? And there's basically a signature malleability concern there where you have, two exactly identical, or the, the signatures are different, but they resolve to the same, uh, reco they recover to the same signer. Well, the trick is basically to say, what if we just always flip the parity, right? So you can take any 65 byte signature and you compress, you, you flip it so that the parity is always, I think 27. Mm -hmm. And then, you also can, because when the parity is that 27, 
then the S value won't use the most significant bit. So then you can compress V and S into a single word. You basically take what was once three, now it's just two words. So you cut down on a word of call data in um, standard ABI encoding, which you know, you're looking at, what, 130 bytes, or 130 gas for those bytes. And uh, just a, a minor optimization that, that you can employ. That's the idea. Nice, thank you. Great questions, everybody. Hey, hi. So uh, assume I'm trying to do like a searching strategy, right? So um, to help users with uh, gas, uh, you may take like signed orders, right? And those are not visible on chain. So for a searcher to like look through all the possibilities of uh, orders out there that I could possibly fill with a match order, where, where would I get a list of all the orders that are not on chain? Like, is there a HTTP API that I could call? Ah, uh, so this this really um, it delves into less of well, how does Seaport do it, and more. All right, what about the marketplaces? They're built on top of Seaport, right? We work at OpenSea. We have an API. If you have access to the API, then you can read from the API and and uh, get a, a sense of the orders. There are also other marketplaces that are built on top of Seaport. You might want to be pulling from those. Right. But it does get more complicated to find all of that. You can listen on chain for the validate events, right. which is one way to do it. You can listen in the mempool <laughs> is another way. Right. So, um, but there is, I think it's, it's definitely an area of active investigation to, to figure out how to best um, democratize that search. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I guess two questions on my end. Uh, one, Great. Is, <laughs> one is, uh, does Seaport support swaps uh, of NFTs uh, today? Absolutely. So when you look at an offer consideration, the items, ETH, or native tokens, ERC20, 721, 1155, any combo of those, Seaport is totally fine with. The exception is the fulfilled basic order method does have more opinionated uh, subset of the possible orders that it's going to support. But yeah, Seaport was built with this idea of barter, like NFT for NFT as a first class is. Yeah, I guess the second question I have might be a little bit, um, yeah, of a comparison question. So uh, we we are right now integrated with like zero X V three for uh, awesome. sort of a private marketplace. So I'm just curious. Uh, I mean, maybe you can speak to like some of the differences between Seaport and zero X V three. Does any? Yeah. Yeah. So first off, zero X is really cool. They are definite innovators in the space. Zero um, X is more geared around single NFT, like buy an NFT, sell an NFT. And it's, it's actually a very good protocol for that. Seaport is more geared around uh, how, do you, how do you grow out from that? There's less, um, less opinionated um, on this, what the exact structure of a listing looks like. Basically for the exact reasons that we just were discussing is a, a top one. Um, Another thing that is different is that Seaport is totally unowned and permissionless. There's no special notion of like a protocol token or a protocol fee that could be turned on. It's just meant to serve as a permissionless piece of public infrastructure on chain. So that is a difference. Um, and, but yeah, big fans of, of what the Xerox team has been able to do. Thanks. Over here. I was wondering if like currently on OpenSea using Seaport, do they utilize any like interesting zones currently? Or um, do you have to like define that yourself as like a someone who like 
creates a listing on OpenSea. So uh, I can't speak too directly for OpenSea. I'm, I'm one of many, uh, uh, but what I can say is that for at least a couple of months after Seaport first went live, it was a brand new protocol, used a lot of assembly, and, and so we, we kept guardrails on. We used a, a global pausable zone and required that all orders that were sent to OpenSea had this zone set on them. And it would allow for us to basically hit the panic button and just cancel every single order if there was a problem with the marketplace. It's now been long enough, and there are enough interesting use cases for zones that um, efforts are underway to really open that up. Other other chains off of uh, mainnet don't currently use a zone. So stay tuned, <laughs> stay tuned on that. And uh, I will also say that if anyone is authoring zones or working on them, get in touch, let us know. We'll definitely, it, it would go a long way to help um, see what zones people are coming up with and, um, and that will definitely inform the discussion and efforts. Oh, uh, we're integrating with Seaport and we're, awesome. <laughs> we're having issues with signature verification where recovered signatures match the original signer, but orders fail. Interesting. Okay. And it's, I've, it's been unsolvable for me. So what are reasons this could be? Okay. So if you have if you have an order that's signed and the signature is valid, right? Like you can recover the signature and it works. There are a number of potential things that you could look into. The first would be checking the order validator, right? That's that's going to scan through and give you a number of potential problems when you go to try and fulfill it. And that's actually it's a very important thing if you are maintaining uh, listings and offers, you have to ensure that you're not putting listings out that aren't fulfillable, right? So um, that's one thing to try. Another, Seaport has this notion of a counter. So every single offerer has a counter that's tracked independent of all of their orders. And at any point, you can just call increment counter and that serves as an eject button where all the orders that are signed with that counter are now invalid. Interestingly though, you don't supply the counter as an explicit argument. It's an implied argument. So if you have two identical orders, except one has counter zero, one has counter one, they'll have different order hashes, but the call is the same. So that's one potential area that um, you can run into issues. The last thing I will say is that cases where there's something really sticky, that's just like confusing and not, um, not making sense, I would really encourage you to go to this discussions board, both for, it's a great forum to lay out all the information and also for others to then benefit from figuring it out. And so I'd encourage you to, to do that. But um, yeah, signatures are, are notoriously finicky to work with. And yeah. it, every, every developer that's, that's had to work with them, that there's always a sense of relief when you finally get your workflow figured out and, and the signatures are working because it can be quite opaque why things are going wrong. The counters, though, uh, they only get incremented when you cancel an order. So it's actually not related to canceling. Mm -hmm. When I call cancel on an order, that cancels a specific order. And that's actually one of the only times you do explicitly provide the counter. Mm -hmm. So it's saying, here's a particular order that I want to cancel. When you call increment counter, you don't provide any arguments. You just call increment counter and it cancels all of your orders that were signed with that counter. Yeah. 
two distinct things. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Uh, how are we doing on time? All right. Uh, well, I guess we've got we got another ten minutes. Maybe we could all workshop. Oh, you want to? You have another question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this might be a little bit unrelated to Seaport, but more on the API. So, any any plans on your end to I guess make the API more enterprise grade, maybe like a higher TPS and so on? Uh, we are we're just focused on Seaport, <laughs> but. Um, Definitely get. We'll, we can put you in touch with the API team. Um, maybe we could workshop a, an interesting zone, something that uh, that would add some new capability to the Seaport. Anyone got any ideas? Something you'd like to see? Yeah. Um, I'm coming a bit late, so I suspect this has always already been raised. But is it poss How about a zone where it's only possible to make sales to certain people, or I suppose certain addresses, or maybe that, certain ENS addresses? That's very possible. Yeah, um, and that actually reminds me of an interesting advanced technique that uh, is used for private sales. So if say I want to I want to sell just a specific NFT and you are the only person that can buy it. What does that look like, right? How would I set that up? One kind of interesting way of doing that is just to say, all right, single offer item my NFT. Consideration item 1 is ETH to me. Consideration item two is my NFT to you, right? So I basically just set it all up. But now if I wanted to go and call these implied mirror order and, you know, just fulfill orders on that, it's not going to work because the, the offer item from me needs to actually match to the, the same order right? The consideration item on that same order. So you got to use match orders for that. And you would then match it with an order from you that just says, I'm just offering the ETH and there's no consideration item, right? So I'm basic, if, if I were to just take that order and sign it, then it's effectively a donation, right? But if I fulfill it alongside this other order, now the two of them together make a complete picture. So that's for just a single private sale. But for, say, I only want to sell my NFT if you're on this allow list. That's easy enough. You have a zone where you just supply, okay, here is a Merkle proof that says that the fulfiller, the caller, is in the root, right? They're one of a, a set of people or... I could check and see like the caller has a balance of this particular token. If I want it to be a token gated thing where only someone that owns this token can buy it from me or something like that. Well, that's all actually, it's pretty straightforward to do with a zone. Hey. Um, so with like, Developing new zones um, and building just generally on top of Seaport, like a new marketplace. Do you see it as like, um, like what's the what are the the steps for for doing that? Is that like create a UI that signs messages and then create like a your own database and API to serve those messages? Uh, do you see that happening as like the pattern as this scales out, or like develop the zone and then like work with OpenSea to have that zone integrated, or maybe like a mix of both? Well, we knew that the place to start was with the smart contract, right? The marketplace, that's, it's the hardest and riskiest thing 
and most expensive to get audited and vetted and all of that. So started with that, the, the contract. And now that that's in place, really where we go from here is, is uh, anyone's guess. But I think that if it, it really depends on the application. If you have a particular flavor of listing that you want to see supported in other marketplaces, then I think the most expedient route to do that would be to go ahead and put it together and then shop it around. And sort of like I mentioned earlier, you know, I would, we would love to, to see what people are working on zones they're creating, and that would really help expedite the process and help standardize around certain zones that do specific things really well. For creating a brand new marketplace from, from the ground up, I think that's it. There still is very much a traditional um, Web two component to it that would need to be um, would need to be undertaken at this stage. But um, I imagine that 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 too will become more uh, accessible to all soon. Is my hope. Yeah. So you spoke a little bit about private um, trade, private sales uh, just now. I imagine that OpenSea is not spawning new contracts for zones every time someone does a private sale. Can you walk us through the flow of a private sale in OpenSea today? Yeah. So, so there's no zone required on private sales. That's basically just taking the standard order and normally you'll see an order with a, it's like the basic order you'll have a single offer item that's either the the tokens that you want to spend or the nft that you want to sell and then you'll have one consideration item the first one by convention like if you use the order validation helper thing the first consideration item is almost always going to be something coming back to you, the offerer, right? And then it'll be followed up by usually fees. Like, here's a fee to the marketplace, here's a fee to the creator. That's the standard order that you would see. But in private sales, one way you can do a private sale is you deviate from that standard a little bit and you just say, I'm actually going to include the the recipient, the person that I want to sell this item to as a consideration item on my order, if that makes sense. So it's like, literally, you need to get this or else you can't take it from me. Yeah, that's the idea. I guess um, like for like a zone idea is that like, I think when I was reading the like OpenSea's like Wyvern contracts, like there was support for just Dutch auctions and fixed sale or fixed price sales. And they had like a comment in it saying like they wanted to maybe do something more advanced or like English auctions or something like that, right? And I remember watching one of your like, I guess if it was like an ETH Denver talk or something like that. And you said that like something like an English auction or that could be possible using the zones. And uh, so I, I should, th well, this is actually another advanced technique that we haven't really touched on that you reminded me of. And that is every item, you can specify a start amount and an end amount. So when you do that, it will look at the start time and the end time on that particular order. And then it does it, a linear interpolation and we'll just pick out, okay, here's the current amount based on where we are along the, the timeline for the order. So oftentimes, like when you talk about a Dutch auction what that, or a reverse Dutch auction, what that really is getting at is this is a, it's a sum listing where the price is going down over time, right? Or the price is going up over time. It's not necessarily auction per se. Now, 
auctions, there's a couple different ways to run them. And it really depends on what you're trying to optimize for and what your trust model is. Oftentimes, what it really uh, comes down to is like, I have a reserve price and I want that reserve price to be met and I want that reserve price to be secret too, right? So um, like one way to handle an auction, assuming you have an auctioneer that is a, someone you trust, is you set the auction, the runner of the auction as the zone on your order. Zones, generally the way that we would think of them is that when you have a restricted order, that zone, you're going to call it and say, is this a valid order? If it is, then um, it'll give back a magic value saying, this is good, go ahead. But another way you can do it is that that zone can actually call Seaport. If they call Seaport, that's also them. If they're the ones that are fulfilling the order, that's also them giving explicit approval per se, right? They're a message sender. So you can basically sign a, a listing that you, here's my, my reserve price. That's the consideration item to me. I'm going to give that to this, this auctioneer, whatever, the marketplace. They're going to keep the order secret. And then they have to be the one to fulfill it, right? It's a restricted order. And they'll apply a tip on that based on the difference between the reserve price and the actual price. There are also constructions where you can do stuff like the commit reveal pattern for hiding the reserve price. You generally have to bond up front. I mean, it gets, it gets complicated depending on whether you're optimizing for the privacy of the, the um, person that's, that's trying to auction the item or if you're trying to optimize for protecting the bidders, you know, if you don't want the person running the auction to pull out of the auction and cancel it and pull their, you want their assets or something, their items. Um, there's, there's a number of different variables to control for, but that's one thing that I think would be really cool to see more work on is leveraging zones to run different kinds of auctions. Yeah. All right. That's time. Thank you all for coming and uh, can't wait to see what you build.